The Almoravid dynasty was an imperial Berber Muslim dynasty centered in Morocco. It established an empire in the 11th century that stretched over the western Maghreb and Al Andalus. Founded by Abu Bekr ibn Umar, the Almoravid capital was Marrakesh, a city the ruling house founded circa 1070. The dynasty originated among the Lamtuna and the Gudala, nomadic Berber tribes of the western Sahara, traversing the territory between the Draa, the Niger, and the Senegal rivers. The Almoravids were crucial in preventing the fall of Al Andalus to the Iberian Christian kingdoms when they decisively defeated a coalition of the Castilian and Aragonese armies at the Battle of Sagrajas in 1086. This enabled them to control an empire that stretched 3,000 kilometers north to south. Their rulers never claimed the title of caliph and instead took on the title of Amir al-Muslimin while formally acknowledging the overlordship of the Abbasid caliphs in Baghdad. However, the rule of the dynasty was relatively short-lived. The Almoravids fell, at the height of their power, when they failed to stop the Masmuda-led rebellion initiated by Ibn Tumar. As a result, their last king Ishaq ibn Ali was killed in Marrakesh in April 1147 by the Amahad Caliphate, which replaced them as a ruling dynasty both in Morocco and Al-Andalus. The term Almoravid comes from the Arabic al murabit through the Spanish al muravid The transformation of the B in al murabit to the V in al muravid is an example of Baitacism in Spanish. In Arabic, al murabit literally means one who is tying but figuratively means one who is ready for battle at a fortress. The term is related to the notion of Ribat Ribat, a North African frontier monastery fortress, through the root RBT. The name al murabit was tied to a school of Malakith law called Dar al murabit and founded in Sous al-Aqsa, modern-day Morocco, by a scholar named Wagag ibn Zalu. Ibn Zalu sent his student Abdallah ibn Yashin to preach Malakit Islam to the Sanaja Berbers of the Adrar. Hence, the name of the al Almoravids comes from the followers of the Dar al Murabidin, the house of those who were bound together in the cause of God. It is uncertain exactly when or why the al Almoravids acquired that appellation. Al Bakri, writing in 1068, before their apex, already calls them the al Murabitin, but does not clarify the reasons for it. Writing three centuries later, Ibn Abizar suggested it was chosen early on by Abdallah ibn Yashin because, upon finding resistance among the Gudala Berbers of Adrar to his teaching, he took a handful of followers to erect a makeshift ribbit on an offshore island. Ibn Idari wrote that the name was suggested by Ibn Yashin in the persevering in the fight sense, to boost morale after a particularly hard-fought battle in the Dra Valley c. 1054, in which they had taken many losses. Whichever explanation is true, it seems certain the appellation was chosen by the Almoravids for themselves, partly with the conscious goal of forestalling any tribal or ethnic identifications. The name might be related to the ribbit of Wagag ibn Zalu in the village of Aglu, where the future Almoravid spiritual leader Abdallah ibn Yashin got his initial training. The 13th century Moroccan biographer Ibn al Zayyad al Tadili, and Qadi Ayad before him in the 12th century, note that Wagag's learning center was called Dar al Murabidin and that might have inspired Ibn Yashin's choice of name for the movement. Contemporaries frequently referred to them as the al Malathaman. The al Moravids veiled themselves below the eyes with a tagalmust, a custom they adapted from southern Sanaja Berbers. Although practical for the desert dust, the al Moravids insisted on wearing the veil everywhere. As a badge of foreignness in urban settings, partly as a way of emphasizing their Puritan credentials. It served as the uniform of the al Moravids. Under their rule, Sumptuary laws forbade anybody else from wearing the veil, thereby making it the distinctive dress of the ruling class. In turn, the succeeding Amahads made a point of mocking the Almoravid veil as symbolic of effeminacy and decadence. A 15th century depiction of the 11th century Almoravid general Abu Bekr ibn Umar near the Senegal River in 1413 Majorcan chart. Abu Bekr was known for his conquests in Africa. The Berbers of the Maghreb in the early Middle Ages could be roughly classified into three major groups, the Zenata across the north, the Masmuda, concentrated in central Morocco, and the Sanaja, clustered in the western part of the Sahara and the hills of the eastern Maghreb. The eastern Sanaja included the Kutama Berbers, who had been the base of the Fatimid rise in the early 10th century, and the Zirid dynasty, who ruled Afrikiya as vassals of the Fatimids after the latter moved to Egypt in 972. The western Sanaja were divided into several tribes, the Gazula and the Lumta in the Dra Valley and the foothills of the Anti-Atlas Range, further south, encamped in the western Sahara. Were the Masufa, the Banu Warth, 
and most southerly of all, the Lumtuna and Gudala, in literal Mauritania down to the borderlands of the Senegal River. The western Sanaja had been converted to Islam some time in the 9th century. They were subsequently united in the 10th century and, with the zeal of new converts, launched several campaigns against the Sudanese. Under their king Timburut Nibin Yusfesar, the Sanaja Lumtuna erected the citadel of Autogast, a critical stop on the trans-Saharan trade route. After the collapse of the Sanaja Union, Autogast passed over to the Ghana Empire, and the trans-Saharan routes were taken over by the Zenata Magrawa of Shijilmasa. The Magrawa also exploited this disunion to dislodge the Sanaja Gazula and Lumta out of their pasture lands in the Su and Draw valleys. Around 1035, the Lumtuna chieftain Abu Abdallah Muhammad ibn Tifat tried to reunite the Sanaja desert tribes, but his reign lasted less than three years. The Almoravid Empire at its height stretched from the city of Odagos to the Saragossa in Al-Andalus around 1040. Yahya ibn Ibrahim, a chieftain of the Gudala, went on pilgrimage to Mecca. On his return, he stopped by Kairouan in Ifriqiya, where he met Abu Imran al-Fasi, a native of Fez and a jurist and scholar of the Sunni Maliki school. At this time, Ifriqiya was in ferment. The Zirid ruler, al Moiz ibn Badis, was openly contemplating breaking with his Shiite Fatimid overlords in Cairo, and the jurists of Kairouan were agitating for him to do so. Within this heady atmosphere, Yahya and Abu Imran fell into conversation on the state of the faith in their western homelands, and Yahya expressed his disappointment at the lack of religious education and negligence of Islamic law among his southern Sanaja people. With Abu Imran's recommendation, Yahya ibn Ibrahim made his way to the ribbit of Waigag ibn Zelyu in the Sioux Valley of southern Morocco, to seek out a Maliki teacher for his people. Waigag assigned him one of his residents, Abdallah ibn Yashin. Abdallah ibn Yashin was a Ghazula Berber, and probably a convert rather than a born Muslim. His name can be read as son of Yasin, suggesting he had obliterated his family past and was reborn of the holy book. Ibn Yashin certainly had the ardor of a Puritan zealot, his creed was mainly characterized by a rigid formalism and a strict adherence to the dictates of the Quran, and the Orthodox tradition. Ibn Yashin's initial meetings with the Gudala people went poorly. As he had more ardor than depth, Ibn Yashin's arguments were disputed by his audience. He responded to questioning with charges of apostasy and handed out harsh punishments for the slightest deviations. The Gudala soon had enough and expelled him almost immediately after the death of his protector, Yahya ibn Ibrahim, sometime in the 1040s. Ibn Yashin, however, found a more favorable reception among the neighboring Lumtuna people. Probably sensing the useful organizing power of Ibn Yashin's pious fervor, the Lumtuna chieftain Yahya ibn Umar al-Lumtuni invited the man to preach to his people. The Lumtuna leaders, however, kept Ibn Yashin on a careful leash, forging a more productive partnership between them. Invoking stories of the early life of Muhammad, Ibn Yashin preached that conquest was a necessary addendum to Islamicization, that it was not enough to merely adhere to God's law, but necessary to also destroy opposition to it. In Ibn Yashin's ideology, anything and everything outside of Islamic law could be characterized as opposition. He identified tribalism, in particular, as an obstacle. He believed it was not enough to urge his audiences to put aside their blood loyalties and ethnic differences, and embrace the equality of all Muslims under the sacred law, it was necessary to make them do so. For the Lumtuna leadership, this new ideology dovetailed with their long desire to re-found the Sananja Union and recover their lost dominions. In the early 1050s, the Lumtuna, under the joint leadership of Yahya ibn Umar and Abdallah ibn Yashin, soon calling themselves the al murabid and set out on a campaign to bring their neighbors over to their cause. Northern Africa from 1053, the al Moravids began to spread their religious way to the Berber areas of the Sahara, and to the region south of the desert. After winning over the Sanaja Berber tribe, they quickly took control of the entire desert trade route, seizing Shijil Masa at the northern end in 1054, and Aotagost at the southern end in 1055. Yahya ibn Umar was killed in a battle in 1057, but Abdullah ibn Yashin, whose influence as a religious teacher was paramount, named his brother Abu Bekr ibn Umar as chief. Under him, the Almoravids soon began to spread their power beyond the desert, and conquered the tribes of the Atlas Mountains. In 1058 they crossed the High Atlas and conquered Igmat, a prosperous commercial town near the foothills of the mountains, and made it their capital. They then came in contact with the Burguada, a Berber tribal confederation, 
who followed an Islamic heresy preached by Salih ibn Tarif three centuries earlier. The Burguata resisted. Abdullah ibn Yashin was killed in battle with them in 1059, in Krifla, a village near Ramani, Morocco. They were, however, completely conquered by Abu Bakr ibn Umar, and were forced to convert to Orthodox Islam. Abu Bakr married a noble and wealthy Berber woman, Zainab and Nafsawiyat, who would become very influential in the development of the dynasty. Zainab was the daughter of a wealthy merchant from Huara, who was said to be from Kairouan. In 1061, Abu Bakr ibn Umar made a division of the power he had established, handing over the more settled parts to his cousin Yusuf ibn Tashfin as viceroy, and also assigning to him his favorite wife Zainab. Ibn Umar kept the task of suppressing the revolts that had broken out in the desert. When he returned to resume control, he found his cousin too powerful to be superseded. Abu Bakr ibn Umar founded the new capital of Marrakesh around this time. Historical sources cite a variety of dates for this event ranging from 1062, given by Ibn Abizar and Ibn Khaldun, to 1078, given by Muhammad al-Idrisi. The year 1070, given by Ibn Idari, is more commonly cited by modern historians. Some writers cite the year 1062. In November 1087 Abu Bekr was killed in battle, according to oral tradition by an arrow, while fighting in the historic region of the Sudan. Yusuf ibn Tashfin had in the meantime brought the large area of what is now known as Morocco, Western Sahara, and Mauritania into complete subjection. In 1080, he conquered the kingdom of Plemkan and founded the present city of that name, his rule extending as far east as Oran. Ghana Empire in the southern wing according to Arab tradition, the Almoravids conquered the Ghana Empire sometime around 1076 CE. An example of this tradition is the record of historian Ibn Khaldun who cited Sheikh Uthman, the Faqi of Ghana, writing in 1394. According to this source, the Almoravids weakened Ghana and collected tribute from the Sudan, to the extent that the authority of the rulers of Ghana dwindled away, and they were subjugated and absorbed by the Susu, a neighboring people of the Sudan. Traditions in Mali related that the Soso attacked and took over Mali as well, and the ruler of the Soso, Sumairo Kante, took over the land. However criticism from Conrad and Fisher argued that the notion of any Almoravid military conquest at its core is merely perpetuated folklore, derived from a misinterpretation or naive reliance on Arabic sources. According to Professor Timothy Insall, the archaeology of ancient Ghana simply does not show the signs of rapid change and destruction that would be associated with any Almoravid-era military conquests. Dirk Lang agreed with the original military incursion theory but argues that this doesn't preclude all more of it political agitation, claiming that the main factor of the demise of the Ghana Empire owed much to the latter. According to Lang, all more of it religious influence was gradual, rather than the result of military action, there the al Moravids gained power by marrying among the nation's nobility. Lang attributes the decline of ancient Ghana to numerous unrelated factors, one of which is likely attributable to internal dynastic struggles instigated by Almoravid influence and Islamic pressures, but devoid of military conquest. This interpretation of events has been disputed by later scholars like Cheryl L. Burkhalter, who argued that, whatever the nature of the conquest in the south of the Sahara, the influence and success of the Almoravid movement in securing West African gold and circulating it widely necessitated a high degree of political control. The traditional position says that the ensuing war with the Almoravids pushed Ghana over the edge, ending the kingdom's position as a commercial and military power by 1100. It collapsed into tribal groups and chieftaincies, some of which later assimilated into the Almoravids while others founded the Mali Empire. The Arab geographer Al-Zuri wrote that the Almoravids ended Ibadism in Tatmecca in 1084 and that Abu Bekr arrived at the Mountain of Gold in the Deep South. After the death of Abu Bekr, the confederation of Berber tribes in the Sahara was divided between the descendants of Abu Bekr and his brother Yahya, and would have lost control of Ghana. Cheryl Burke Halter suggests that Abu Bekr's son Yahya was the leader of the Almoravid expedition that conquered Ghana in 1076, and that the Almoravids would have survived the loss of Ghana and the defeat in the Maghreb by the Almohads, and would have ruled the Sahara until the end of the 12th century. Southern Iberia and the northern wing in 1086 Yusuf ibn Tashfin was invited by the Muslim Tafa princes of Al-Andalus in the Iberian Peninsula to defend their territories from the encroachment of Alfonso VI, King of Leon and Castile. In that year, ibn Tashfin crossed the Strait of Gibraltar to al and defeated Castile at the Battle of Azayaka. 
he was prevented from following up his victory by trouble in Africa, which he chose to settle in person. He returned to Iberia in 1090, avowedly for the purpose of annexing the Tafa principalities of Iberia. He was supported by most of the Iberian people, who were discontented with the heavy taxation imposed upon them by their spendthrift rulers. Their religious teachers, as well as others in the East, detested the Tafa rulers for their religious indifference. The clerics issued a fatwa that Yusuf was of sound morals and had the religious right to dethrone the rulers, whom he saw as heterodox in their faith. By 1094, Yusuf had annexed most of the major tafas, with the exception of the one at Saragossa. The Almoravids were victorious at the Battle of Consuegra, during which the son of El Cid, Diego Rodriguez, perished. Alfonso, with some Leonese, retreated into the castle of Consuegra, which was besieged for eight days until the Almoravids withdrew to the south. After friendly correspondence with the caliph at Baghdad, whom he acknowledged as Amir al muminin Yusuf ibn Tashfin in 1097 assumed the title of Amir al muslimin He died in 1106, when he was reputed to have reached the age of 100. The Almoravid power was at its height at Yusuf's death, the Moorish Empire that included all of northwest Africa as far eastward as Algiers. And all of Iberia south of the Tagus and as far eastward as the mouth of the Ebro, and including the Balearic Islands. An Almoravid dinar coin from Seville, 1116. Semicolon the Almoravid gold dinar would set the standard of the Iberian Maravedi. In 1108 Tamim al-Yusuf defeated the Kingdom of Castile at the Battle of Uglis. Yusuf did not reconquer much territory from the Christian kingdoms, except that of Valencia, but he did hinder the progress of the Christian Reconquista by uniting al Andalus. In 1134 at the Battle of Fraga the Almoravids were victorious and even succeeded in slaying Alfonso I of Aragon in the battle. Under Yusuf's son and successor, Ali ibn Yusuf, Sintra and Santaram were added, and he invaded Iberia again in 1119 and 1121, but the tide had turned, as the French had assisted the Aragonese to recover Saragossa. In 1138, Ali ibn Yusuf was defeated by Alfonso VII of Leon, and in the Battle of Aurique, by Afonso I of Portugal, who thereby won his crown. Lisbon was conquered by the Portuguese in 1147. According to some scholars, Ali ibn Yusuf represented a new generation of leadership that had forgotten the desert life for the comforts of the city. He was defeated by the combined action of his Christian foes in Iberia and the agitation of the Yamahads in Morocco. After Ali ibn Yusuf's death in 1143, his son Tashfin ibn Ali lost ground rapidly before the Yamahads. In 1146 he was killed in a fall from a precipice while attempting to escape after a defeat near Orn. His two successors were Ibrahim ibn Tashfin and Ishak ibn Ali, but their reigns were short. The conquest of the city of Marrakesh by the Almohads in 1147 marked the fall of the dynasty, though fragments of the Almoravids continued to struggle throughout the empire. Among these fragments, there was the rebel Yahya al sarawiya who resisted Almohad rule in the Maghreb for eight years after the fall of Marrakesh before surrendering in 1155. Also in 1155, the remaining Almoravids were forced to retreat to the Balearic Islands and later Afrikia under the leadership of the Banu Ghania who were eventually influential in the downfall of their conquerors, the Almohads, in the eastern part of the Maghreb. The Almoravid movement started as a conservative Islamic reform movement inspired by the Maliki school of jurisprudence. The writings of Abu Imran al-Fasi, a Moroccan Maliki scholar, influenced Yahya ibn Ibrahim in the early Almoravid movement. The Pisagriffin, believed to have originated in 11th century Iberia. Amir Abenison describes the art of the Almoravid period as influenced by the integration of several areas into a single political unit and the resultant development of a widespread Andalusi Maravi style. As well as the tastes of the Sanaja rulers as patrons of art. Benison also challenges Robert Hillenbrand's characterization of the art of Al Andalus and the Maghreb as provincial and peripheral in consideration of Islamic art globally and of the contributions of the Almoravids is sparse as a result of the empire's puritanical fervor and ephemerality. At first, the Almoravids, subscribing to the conservative Maliki school of Islamic jurisprudence, rejected what they perceived as decadence, and a lack of piety among the Iberian Muslims of the Andalusi Tafa kingdoms. However, monuments and textiles from Almeria from the late Almoravid period indicate that the empire had changed its attitude with time. Artistic production under the Almoravids included finely constructed minbars produced in Cordoba, marble basins and tombstones in Almeria, fine textiles in Almeria, Malaga, Seville, and luxury ceramics. 
a stele found at Gaussani believed to have been created in Almeria during the Almoravid period. Now located at the National Museum of Mali. Marble work A large group of marble tombstones have been preserved from the first half of the 12th century. They were crafted in Almeria and Al Andalus, at a time when it was a prosperous port city under Almoravid control. The tombstones were made of Mikhail marble, which was quarried locally, and carved with extensive Kufic inscriptions that were sometimes adorned with vegetal or geometric motifs. These demonstrate that the Almoravids not only reused Umaway marble columns and basins, but also commissioned new works. The inscriptions on them are dedicated to various individuals, both men and women, from a range of different occupations, indicating that such tombstones were relatively affordable. The stones take the form of either rectangular stele or of long horizontal prisms known as gabrias. They have been found in many locations across West Africa and Western Europe, which is evidence that a wide-reaching industry and trade in marble existed. A number of pieces found in France were likely acquired from later pillaging. Some of the most ornate tombstones found outside Al-Andalus were discovered in Gaussane in the African Sahel, testament to the reach of Almoravid influence into the African continent. Two Almoravid period marble columns have also been found reused as spolia and later monuments in Fez. One is incorporated into the window of the Dar al muwakkad overlooking the courtyard of the Karawiyan Mosque, built in the Marinid period. The other is embedded into the decoration of the exterior southern facade of the Zawiya of Molay Idris II, a structure which was rebuilt by Molay Ismail. Textiles The fact that Ibn Tumart, leader of the Ahmad movement, is recorded as having criticized Sultan Ali ibn Yusuf for sitting. On a luxurious silken cloak at his Grand Mosque in Marrakesh indicates the important role of textiles under the Almoravids. Fragment of the Shroud of San Pedro de Osma, early 12th century, the imagery features pairs of lions and harpies, surrounded by men holding griffins. Many of the remaining fabrics from the Almoravid period were reused by Christians, with examples in the reliquary of San Isidoro in Leon. A chasuble from St. Cernan in Toulouse, the chasuble of San Juan de Ortega in the Church of Quintanio Ortuna, the Shroud of San Pedro de Osma, and a fragment found at the Church of Thar in the Eastern Pyrenees. Some of these pieces are characterized by the appearance of Kufic or Hispano Kufic woven inscriptions, with letters sometimes ending in ornamental vegetal flourishes. The chasuble of San Juan de Ortega is one such example, made of silk and gold thread and dating to the first half of the 12th century. The Shroud of San Pedro de Osma is notable for its inscription stating this was made in Baghdad, suggesting that it was imported. However, more recent scholarship has suggested that the textile was instead produced locally in centers such as Almeria, but that they were copied or based on eastern imports. It's even possible that the inscription was knowingly falsified in order to exaggerate its value to potential sellers. al sakadi of Malaga, a 12th-century writer and market inspector, wrote that there were regulations designed to prohibit the practice of making such false inscriptions. As a result of the inscription, many of these textiles are known in scholarship as the Baghdad group, representing a stylistically coherent and artistically rich group of silken textiles seemingly dating to reign of Ali ibn Yusuf or the first half of the 12th century. Aside from the inscription, the Shroud of San Pedro de Osma is decorated with images of two lions and harpies inside roundels that are ringed by images of small men holding griffins, repeating across the whole fabric. The chasuble from St. Cernan is likewise decorated with figural images, in this case a pair of peacocks repeating in horizontal bands, with vegetal stems separating each pair and small Kufic inscriptions running along the bottom. The decorative theme of having a regular grid of roundels containing images of animals and figures, with more abstract motifs filling the spaces in between, has origins traced as far back as Persian Sasanian textiles. In subsequent periods, starting with the Amahads, these roundels with figurative imagery are progressively replaced with more abstract roundels, while epigraphic decoration becomes more prominent than before. Calligraphy and manuscript illumination and illuminated Quran manuscript in florid Kufic and Maghrebi script. In early Islamic manuscripts, Kufic was the main script used for religious texts. Western or Maghrebi Kufic evolved from the standard Kufic style and was marked by the transformation of the low swooping sections of letters from rectangular forms to long semicircular forms. It is found in 10th century Qurans before the Almoravid period. Almoravid Kufic is the variety of Maghrebi Kufic script that was used as an official display script during the Almoravid period. Eventually, Maghrebi Kufic gave rise to a distinctive cursive script known as Maghrebi, the only cursive script of Arabic derived from Kufic, which was fully formed by the early 12th century under the Almoravids. 
This style was commonly used in Qurans and other religious works from this period onward, but it was rarely ever used in architectural inscriptions. One version of this script during this early period is the Andalusi script, which was associated with Al-Andalus. It was usually finer and denser, and while the loops of letters below the line are semicircular, the extensions of letters above the line continue to use straight lines that recall its Kufic origins. Another version of the script is rounder and larger, and is more associated with the Maghreb, although it is nonetheless found in Andalusi volumes too. Part of the frontispiece and a page from the text of a Maghrebi or Andalusi Quran dated to 1090, the oldest known illuminated. Quran from this region The oldest known illuminated Quran from the Western Islamic world dates from 1090. Towards the end of the Tafas period and the beginning of the Almoravid domination in Al-Andalus. It was produced either in the Maghreb or Al-Andalus and is now kept at the Uppsala University Library. Its decoration is still in the earliest phases of artistic development, lacking the sophistication of later volumes, but many of the features that were standard in later manuscripts are present. The script is written in the Maghrebi style in black ink but the diacritics are in red or blue, simple gold and black roundels mark the end of verses, and headings are written in gold kufic inside a decorated frame and background. It also contains a frontispiece, of relatively simple design, consisting of a grid of lozenges variously filled with gold vegetal motifs, gold netting, or gold kufic inscriptions on red or blue backgrounds. More sophisticated illumination is already evident in a copy of Asahi dated to 1120, also produced in either the Maghreb or Al-Andalus. With a rich frontispiece centered around a large medallion formed by an interlacing geometric motif, filled with gold backgrounds and vegetal motifs. A similarly sophisticated Quran, dated to 1143 and produced in Cordoba, contains a frontispiece with an interlacing geometric motif forming a panel filled with gold and a knotted blue roundel at the middle. Ceramics The Almoravid conquest of Al-Andalus caused a temporary rupture in ceramic production but it returned in the 12th century. There is a collection of about 2,000 Maghrebi Andalusi ceramic basins or bowls in Pisa, where they were used to decorate churches from the early 11th to 15th centuries. There were a number of varieties of ceramics under the Almoravids, including Quer de Seca pieces. The most luxurious form was iridescent lusterware, made by applying a metallic glaze to the pieces before a second firing. This technique came from Iraq and flourished in Fatimid Egypt. Minbar's detail of the Almoravid Minbar, commissioned by Ali bin Yusuf bin Tashvin al-Murabidi 1137 for his great mosque in Marrakesh. The Almoravid Minbars, such as the Minbar of the Grand Mosque of Marrakesh commissioned by Sultan Ali ibn Yusuf, or the Minbar for the University of al karawiyan express the Almoravid's Maliki legitimacy. Their inheritance of the Umawe imperial role, and the extension of that imperial power into the Maghreb. Both minbars are exceptional works of marquetry and woodcarving, decorated with geometric compositions, inlaid materials, and arabesque reliefs. The Almoravid period, along with the subsequent Amahad period, is considered one of the most formative stages of Moroccan and Moorish architecture, establishing many of the forms and motifs of this style that were refined in subsequent centuries. Manuel Casamar Perez remarks that the Almoravid scaled back the Andalusi trend towards heavier and more elaborate decoration which had developed since the Caliphate of Cordoba and instead prioritized a greater balance between proportions and ornamentation. In their North African constructions, the Almoravids explored the use of cusping to make arches more decorative, as seen here in the Almoravid Pa in Marrakesh. The two centers of artistic production in the Islamic West before the rise of the Almoravids were Kairouan and Cordoba, both former capitals in the region which served as sources of inspiration. The Almoravids were responsible for establishing a new imperial capital at Marrakesh, which became a major center of architectural patronage thereafter. The Almoravids adopted the architectural developments of Al-Andalus, such as the complex interlacing arches of the Great Mosque in Cordoba and of the Eliafiria Palace in Saragossa, while also introducing new ornamental techniques from the east such as Mukernas. After taking control of Al-Andalus in the Battle of Sagrajas, the Almoravids sent Muslim, Christian and Jewish artisans from Iberia to North Africa to work on monuments. The Great Mosque in Algiers, the Great Mosque of Tlemcen and al karawi and in Fez are important examples of Almoravid architecture. The Almoravid Qut is one of the few Almoravid monuments in Marrakesh surviving, and is notable for its highly ornate interior dome with carved stucco decoration, complex arch shapes, and minor Mukernas cupolas in the corners of the structure. The central nave of the expanded Karawiyan Mosque notably features the earliest full-fledged example of Mukherna's vaulting in the Western Islamic world. 
The complexity of these Mukernas vaults at such an early date, only several decades after the first simple Mukernas vaults appeared in distant Iraq, has been noted by architectural historians as surprising. Another high point of all Moravid architecture is the intricate rib dome in front of the Mikrab of the Great Mosque of Plemken, which likely traces its origins to the 10th century rib domes of the Great Mosque of Cordoba. The structure of the dome is strictly ornamental, consisting of multiple ribs or intersecting arches forming a 12 pointed star pattern. It is also partly see through, allowing some outside light to filter through a screen of pierced and carved arabesque decoration that fills the spaces between the ribs. Aside from more ornamental religious structures, the Almoravids also built many fortifications, although most of these in turn were demolished or modified by the Almohads in later dynasties. The new capital, Marrakesh, initially had no city walls but a fortress known as the Qasar el Hayar was built by the city's founder, Abu Bakr ibn Umar, in order to house the treasury and serve as an initial residence. Eventually, circa 1126, Ali ibn Yusuf also constructed a full set of walls, made of rammed earth, around the city in response to the growing threat of the Yamahads. These walls, although much restored and partly expanded in later centuries, continue to serve as the walls of the Medina of Marrakesh today. The Medina's main gates were also first built at this time, although many of them have since been significantly modified. Bab Dukala, one of the western gates, is believed to have best preserved its original Almoravid layout. It has a classic bent entrance configuration, of which variations are found throughout the medieval period of the Maghreb and Al-Andalus. Elsewhere, the archaeological site of Taskamout, southeast of Marrakesh, and Amargu, northeast of Fez, provide evidence about other Almoravid forts. Built out of rubble stone or rammed earth, they illustrate similarities with older Hamidid fortifications, as well as an apparent need to build quickly during times of crisis. The walls of Plemken were likewise partly built by the Almoravids, using a mix of rubble stone at the base and rammed earth above. In domestic architecture, none of the Almoravid palaces or residences have survived, and they are known only through texts and archaeology. During his reign, Ali ibn Yusuf added a large palace and royal residence on the south side of the Qasar el Hayar. This palace was later abandoned and its function was replaced by the Amahad Kasbah, but some of its remains have been excavated and studied in the 20th century. These remains have revealed the earliest known example in Morocco of a Riyadh garden. In 1960 other excavations near Shishawa revealed the remains of a domestic complex or settlement dating from the Almoravid period or even earlier. It consisted of several houses, two hammams, a water supply system, and possibly a mosque. On the site were found many fragments of architectural decoration which are now preserved at the Archaeological Museum of Rabat. These fragments are made of deeply carved stucco featuring Kufic and cursive Arabic inscriptions as well as vegetal motifs such as palmettes and acanthus leaves. The structures were also featured painted decoration and red ochre, typically consisting of border motifs composed of two interlacing bands. Similar decoration has also been found in the remains of former houses excavated in 2006 under the 12th century Almoravid expansion of the Karawian Mosque in Fez. In addition to the usual border motifs were larger interlacing geometric motifs as well as Kufic inscriptions with vegetal backgrounds, all executed predominantly in red. A plaque at the burial place of the poet King al mutamid ibn Abad, interred 1095 in Igmat, Morocco. The Almoravid movement has its intellectual origins in the writings and teachings of Abu Imran al-Fasi, who first inspired Yahya ibn Ibrahim of the Ghadala tribe in Karawan. Ibn Ibrahim then inspired Abdallah ibn Yashin to organize for jihad and start the Almoravid movement. Moroccan literature flourished in the Almoravid period. The political unification of Morocco and Al-Andalus under the Almoravid dynasty rapidly accelerated the cultural interchange between the two continents. Beginning when Yusuf bin Tashfayan sent al mutamid bin Abad, former poet king of the Ta'fa of Seville, into exile in Tangier and ultimately Igmat. The historians Ibn Hayyan, al Bakri, Ibn Basim, and al Fath ibn Kakan all lived in the Almoravid period. Ibn Basim authored Dakira fi Mahasin al al Jazira, al Fath ibn Kakan authored Khaledu al Ikian, and al Bakri authored al Masalikwa al Mamalik. In the Almoravid period, two writers stand out. Ayad ben Mosa and Ibn Baja. Ayad is known for having authored Kitab al Shifa Bita Rifik al Mustafa. Many of the seven saints of Marrakesh were men of letters. The Muwasha was an important form of poetry and music in the Almoravid period. Great poets from the period are mentioned in anthologies such as Qarida al Qasar, al Mutrib, and Mujam as Sifr. 
The Moroccan historian Muhammad al-Manuni noted that there were 104 paper mills in Fez under Yusuf ibn Tashfin in the 11th century. Abdallah ibn Yasin imposed very strict disciplinary measures on his forces for every breach of his laws. The Almoravid's first military leader, Yahya ibn Umar al-Lamtuni, gave them a good military organization. Their main force was infantry, armed with javelins in the front ranks and pikes behind, which formed into a phalanx, and was supported by camelmen and horsemen on the flanks. They also had a flag carrier at the front who guided the forces behind him. When the flag was upright, the combatants behind would stand, and when it was turned down, they would sit. Al-Bakri reports that, while in combat, the Almoravids did not pursue those who fled in front of them. Their fighting was intense and they did not retreat when disadvantaged by an advancing opposing force, they preferred death over defeat. These characteristics were possibly unusual at the time. After the death of El Cid, Christian Chronicles reported a legend of a Turkish woman leading a band of 300 Amazons, black female archers. This legend was possibly inspired by the ominous veils on the faces of the warriors and their dark skin colored blue by the indigo of their robes. Thanks for watching.